That was a very generous uh, introduction. Thank you so much, Murray. <clears throat> and I'm really honored to be here, and take part. Um, I have a full set I bought. Um, I was training in New York of the Eranos uh, lectures uh, from the Christine Mann Library. There was a secondary set that they didn't want. So um, it looks at me all the time, um, those volumes. and to be here and to be part of this is, uh, is definitely an honor. <clears throat> but I want, to, I want to be specific and address the question that's hung over us. And that is, do we have any duty as people who are interested in internal psychological growth? Do we have any duty to the collective? What is our duty? Um, do we have to go to the barricades? Uh, do we have to enter lawsuits? Do we have to sort of uh, chain ourselves to bridges? Uh, or uh, where do we stand on this? And I want to understand that not by means of just a, a narrative, but rather to look specifically at what the window on eternity mandala, which we've been looking at, has to, has to say about that. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, um, those of us who are <clears throat> drawn to the path of our own individuation, the search for a internal unity, um, we must admit it's a personal struggle. I mean, um, I'm not sure how you get the next. Uh, this, part. this one, I think. Let me see. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> That's how I see it. That's how I see our path. I mean, we all strike out on our own. Where uh, it makes sense that the realization of the self, the path of individuation, was never expressed by Jung as requiring a collective effort to support us, um, those who seek to individuate, nor did he indicate a way for us to overtly support the collective? He gave no instructions on that, and not just the individual. Uh, it was never intended that we journey to the self um, uh, should be part of a sangha or uh, Hindu akada, or um, those on the psychological journey of individuation are not summoned to get together although we're all here for this conference, to support each other. Um, we actually are missing something, which is a sangha. We're missing a collective group of people, all of whom get together and support each other on this path. So we have to accept, therefore, that in all of us, in, in unraveling the confusion of all our lives, that we do so by an internal orientation, uh, that our Western psychological path, which we're all on, is very solipsistic and most importantly, as we see in our therapeutic practices, not many individuals in the collective are in fact up to this journey. <clears throat> so the first issue is whether or not there is such a thing as collective individuation. Um, it's clear that Jung didn't think so and established a gradation of those who could individu individuate and those who could not. Um, this all occurs in his critical Liverpool dream, which has been mentioned several times. Um, it took place in Liverpool because he called it the pool of life. This is in, in, in the city of Liverpool, although Jung never went there and had no real connection with it, but Liverpool grabbed it as there uh, in the center of town, the pool of life. And the dream takes place there. Um, the critical nature of this dream and, <clears throat> dream and explaining the path of individuation and a prelude to what I want to talk about with the collective cannot be underestimated. Um, it arrived at a time where he says in memories, dreams, reflections, 
He said, without such a vision, without this dream, I might perhaps have lost my orientation and have compelled to abandon my undertaking. That's how important this dream was to him. Here's the essence of the dream right here. He's in a structured area, a broad square, a square dimly illuminated by street lights into which many streets converge. And there's a center there, and the center has a magnolia tree in the middle of a small island. And the little island blaze with sunlight. It was, uh, and on it stood a magnolia tree in a shower of reddish blossoms. And he said that I was carried away by the beauty of the flowering tree and the sunlit island. So this very much was him was the intimation of there in fact, a center, it confirmed his long held intuition, drawing mandalas, which was discussed in, by the last speaker, about the existence of there being a numinous center in psyche, that something bright and alive is within us in the center, which he of course referred to as the self. And he proposed a realization of the self as the essence of individuation. As is relevant to our analysis about collective individuation, he said this, he said, my companions commented on the abominable weather and obviously did not see the tree. They didn't see the tree. This raises the issue of gradation as these companions did not obtain the realization of the self that he obtained. They're distinct from him. There were about half a dozen of them who at least accompanied him as he ascended from the marketplace below to a plateau where this was apparent to him. It was a very, very small percentage then of those in the marketplace. I mean, <clears throat> the way he describes it is that they took a trip, I don't know if you recognize this, Toten Gosling in Basel, a, a very steep path. He said, that's where we all it reminded him of that path up. If you know, if you know this, you're a witness that it's a narrow upwards climb. It doesn't take that long. Significantly graphically explaining the nature of the journey to realization. You have to go up and make a climb. At least six did ascend with him up that to a plateau, a higher plateau, away from the worldly, worldly concerns of the marketplace. So the collective is recognized as able to produce individuals who might have the capacity to uh, uh, do this in some instances. They even reach the tree next to him and bring him to the edge of, uh, they're at the edge of realization. And if we stop there, we'd say that the idea of collective individuation means very little. What does it mean that the, the collective is going to individuate? There's also no uh, explicit mention by Jung in the dream that he needs to help his companions. He didn't turn to them and say, look here, have a look at what this is. Uh, he didn't even point out the tree. The most that can be said is that they accompanied him. So they played a part in his realization. He needed the collective. It carries the implication that he couldn't proceed to his own realization without companions from the collective or his ideas would go nowhere if he was by himself. If he just said, I, I've had this dream and uh, I'm all by myself and that's the end of it. Nobody's going to uh, pay any attention. So maybe that's how I feel about it. It was a recognition that he needed those people to come along to be a witness to him. There's also the idea that others can individuate is amplified in the dream when he's informed that another Swiss live there. And he said, I know very well why he was. And that was uh, Herman Sig, um, who he gave, uh, according to what I've read about Sig, he was, uh, Jung only had one really close friend, and that was Sig. Uh, but I could be, could be wrong. And uh, that's Deidre Bear wrote about that. And, but what's interesting is that he had, in the black books, drawn this town map and it shows the difference between what he realized and the possibility open to others. The main large center is his center. The 
convergence of eight streets, uh, which is a, an arrangement repeated with the other two smaller centers. So there's a similarity in relation to the potential because there's eight is a ordering function. It's a multiple of four, uh, a numerical construct of order and balance, a stable quaternity. There are only three centers shown in this street uh, or in this city. Uh, Jung adds in Memory Streams Reflections uh, what he calls a supplementary comment that each of the four quadrants of the city have their own central point, but three of them are only a small replica of the island. The inhabitants of the city therefore must find their own way. They must do their own journey of individuation. He's not really helping them along. The collective's going nowhere. I think um, that, uh, well, I know that this is the basis for this <clears throat> window on eternity mandala, which you've seen already several times. He does say about this, that this is a painting of the dream, but it, quote, came out rather different. It offers a wider perspective, the relationship of the self for an individual and the collective. The difference between the dream and the mandala clearly lies in the mandala connecting up many centers, the little lights which are there. And also, if you notice at the top and the bottom, there's a center that's there, be the crossing of two roads, although the lights aren't in fact there. All of them actually saying, well, there is some kind of, and he doesn't explain it yet, some kind of reciprocal relationship between those little lights and his big light, which is his realization of the self. He explains his realization that there's a, uh, that the ruby, it was ruby colored glass and it shone like a four rayed star. I mean, you can see it does shine, doesn't it? And from that square uh, radiates eight main streets, uh, the one shown in black, um, same as in the dream, reading out from each smaller enclosure, each smaller enclosure with, has also eight side streets that meet with shining points. Um, he says, this mandala combines the classic motifs of flower, star, circle, precinct, the temenos, a plan of the city divided into quarters with a citadel. Uh, I've added that because the other day, uh, Murray uh, showed this as well. And Jung very much used the concept of citadel, which he said is that an idea he expresses later in relation to finding the philosopher's stone, that it has to be in a citadel because it therefore will, quote, uh, will not be, quote, eaten by moths nor dug out by thieves, but remains for the salvation of others. So you need a temenos, you need some way to protect it, and that the main mandala, which we're looking at, actually shows that everything is very protected and placed in a very um, secure location. What confronts us is the grandeur of the glowing center in stark contrast to the smaller centers of the collective. You could say looked at as one mandala through the road connections, the roads in and out. You can get out of the smaller places up to the main roads leading to the main self. Uh, that it can obtains perspective and therefore numinosity because it's a center of that intensity only within a larger structure as it did in the dream as well. And therefore offers to all of the others, the other little areas, um, some numinous goal that's unmistakable. Nobody can miss it at that brightness. It seemed interdependent because if the, if the center wasn't there or the structure wasn't there, the image would lose its significance. Each is therefore necessary, <clears throat> sustained by reciprocity. And reciprocity is in fact written about by the French philosopher Gilbert Simonde who insists that reciprocity is essential for personal individuation. He actually was influenced by Jung and therefore he's referring to individuation in the Jungian sense. He says, quote, both individuations, the psychic and the collective are reciprocal to one another. 
They allow for the definition of a category of the trans individu individual, which can be used to explain the unity of the interior individuation and the exterior in individuation. It can be used uh, if we use Simon, Simondon's idea and the first take a first pass about what that reciprocity means to be expressing that in our troubled world, circumstances must exist that within some form of protected temenos, each of those separate areas that exist in the larger collective, the individual is able to individuate, but the possibility exists in the community to do so. And the self can then manifest within the collective if individuals are informed of its existence. So the image therefore anticipates a reciprocity where the collective supports individuals in their process to reach the center, the grand prize of humanity in order to advance the well-being of the entire society. But in looking at the mandala, it's hard to ignore the comparative size of Jung at the center and all the little lights. Um, it could be easily interpreted as Jung's inflation. He realized that when he was participating in the Kundalini seminars in October 1932, he mentions the dream and he actually says, um, quote, I am not the center, I'm one of those little sidelights. He says he's this instead. In that way, my Western prejudice that I was the center of the mandala was corrected, that I am everything, the whole show, the king, the god. We have come down from the notion, but we have anticipated the divinity, so we have come down. Now, I've puzzled a long time over exactly what he meant, and I was prepared to give you three explanations. Um, and I've spoken to everybody about it last week, to Sona Shantasani, and spoken to Murray about it, and others about what, what actually would that mean. But I had a, a dream about it last night. And the only bad thing about it is it woke me up at four in the morning, and it was so powerful, I couldn't even get close to getting back to sleep. So if I fall asleep, uh, <laughs> I know this. <clears throat> and what happened was I was looking at the mandala, this particular mandala, and all of a sudden it became like, uh, this is in the dream, it became like Google Maps Street View. All of a sudden I went down and I'm, you know how Google Maps has that, and you know, all of a sudden I'm down in the mandala. And I'm actually at that corner, the very right-hand corner, where the first, uh, over on the right, under Jung there, where the edge is. And I'm in a place called Hardwar in India. I don't know if any of you have been there. Hardwar is uh, one of the important religious places where the Kumbha Mela takes place periodically, uh, the great gathering that happens uh, every 12 years. And that uh, line going towards the self actually is the Ganges <clears throat> in the dream. And what happens with uh, the Ganges at Hardwar is it comes from the mountains, the Himalayas, through Gangotri and comes down to Rishikesh, where the water is flowing so intently that the people to go in it and have a bath, they have to hang on to big metal change. And then it hits Hardwar, where it, the foothills of the Himalayas, and it's very calm and peaceful as it goes along. And it struck me in the dream, I said, ah, oh, that's the river of change. In other words, that's what's happening. We're in a constant river of change. It keeps on moving. Uh, there's no static way that it actually goes. And then I looked around, and there I saw all these sadhus, these monks, the itinerant monks, and they're all dressed in ochre robes. And I realized, well, they seem lit up in the otherwise movement of the community in Hardwar, which is, is intensely everybody running around in every different direction with cars and rickshaws, and, and they were the little lights. And I realized, well, they are the little lights, that the people who have individuated are the little lights. But then I looked up and I saw in the distance a big statue of Shiva, which actually exists. It's 100 feet high, and I didn't have time to incorporate it in my slides because it was last night. Uh, 100 feet high, 30 meters high. And it's got Shiva, and I realized, well, that's like the big light. That's that 
one in the middle, that Shiva. Shiva being, uh, in a sense, um, uh, androgynous, but also Shiva was in, uh, has a mudra, a hand motion, and the and mudra in the dream was like, which is the one that he is in in the statue, was like this, which actually is the Adaya uh, mudra, which says, and I had to look this up this morning, which actually says, uh, you're safe, you're protected, it's all going according to plan. So uh, that's why he said, I would think, that he is indeed one of the little lights. The, the self is beyond Jung and beyond all of us. The self is the essential core of our being. It's the precondition um, of who we are and, and uh, what actually we can become. Um, I did have a lot of arguments, so my, my talk will be um, be shorter now, because I did have, re he was buttonholed when he was asked that question at the Kundalini seminars. One of his patients said, am I ever going to be like you? And uh, um, Jung therefore was put on the spot and said, oh, no, I'm not the, I'm not the big man uh, on something like that. Um, that reminds me when I there was a, a sadhu that I saw in, in, in Hardwar in India who seemed like extraordinary. And I walked up to him, I said, could I ever become like you? And he said, no. And I said, why not? He said, because I have a bricklayer's mind, you don't. Which brings me to the next question. And that question is, We need that star. We need to know the self is there. Um, we need to actually, for the person who's realized the self, the men, as that sadhu did, the mandala suggests he or she becomes an inspiration to the others. Perhaps then to wander into the marketplace and bring the light. Um, accordingly, personal individuation, our individuation, the process that we're all on is prior in time to collective individuation. It has to take place. We can take it further that those who have some realization, uh, which uh, I think all of us wouldn't be here unless we had that, uh, imperfect as it is, are also needed for the benefit of the collective, not to uh, solve the problems of the world, but to actually raise them to a level where the individual deeds reflect the interconnectedness of us, of us all. It's a very important concept for Jung that the self is manifested in deeds. Um, he says specifically that the self only manifests when you produce what you produce between yourself and your surroundings, because he says, quote, the self appears in deeds and deeds always mean relationships. It's what you do that indicates the, the self. It's therefore through the individuation process that we will be, this is just what Jung saying in this, uh, I'm not necessarily agreeing with it all yet, but this will be, make us better, responsible, social person, improving the social conditions, just as this is echoed in the last Oxerting pictures. And he states, but individuation means precisely the more complete fulfillment of the collective qualities of the human being, that's our, our qualities as we individuate, since adequate consideration of the peculiarity of the individual is more conducive to a better social performance than when the peculiarity is neglected or suppressed. If this is the case, returning again to focus on the image, what does it suggest is our duty then? I could say, based on how far I've gotten so far, I could say <clears throat> my duty is just to keep on <clears throat> working on myself and then I'll be a better person. My deeds will show in the community and, uh, and so on. But uh, it's a question that I've, I've grappled with and it doesn't really seem to be enough at these times. Uh, especially as Nancy was saying this morning and others have, we don't even have to talk about the nightmare that's, uh, that surrounds us and what we have to do, even though I'm comforted a bit by Shiva and also by the fact that there is the river of change. But nevertheless, the lesson of the image is that each of us is actively and intrinsically involved in the collective. 
we have to be involved in the collective. Individual and collective are inextricably bound together at the fundamental level of mutual reliance and communication. There is thus a clear duty, if that's the case, that then arises from that red book image for those who seek individuation to bring the self to the attention of fellow members of the collective by their deeds. Um, so that they may then be inspired to grow psychologically. Uh, Eric Neumann in a letter to Jung in 1934 uh, says just this, he says, the individual, quote, inasmuch as he individuates, stands in a close relationship, namely a compensatory relationship to the community. He gives back to the community or she gives back to the community. So the mandala implies that those who seek to individu individuate must understand themselves as belonging to the collective, that they are in a reciprocal relationship to the collective and therefore have a duty to the collective to individuate for the benefit of the collective. And before he realized this, the self so fully in 1927 and had that dream, Jung explained this exact perspective. He said, quote, as the individual is not just a single separate being, his very existence presupposes a collective relationship. It follows that the process of individuation must lead to more intense and broader collective relationships and not to isolation. So it seems that we've reached the point now where we might think we have an answer and the answer might not be satisfactory. It says that our duty um, as people who are interested in psychological growth is to bring attention to the self by our deeds and interactions and nothing more. And it, it, we can understand why, because the whole idea of the self is that the moment that we see the self in any form, or have any realization of it is um, it revolutionizes the ego oriented psyche, but it, it sets up in contradic contradistinction to the ego another center and therefore leads to what he calls the self, touch the self, the idea of the self, that you're, there's a centering process within you, and there's something sacred within you, like the Atman in Hinduism then that would be enough to begin. The Not something suggested by Simondon, but, <clears throat> but it relates to the power which Jungians would pay attention to of the symbol and manifest the orientation of individuals and the collective once it's formed and if individuals then understand it. But I can't say that we're all going to be happy with it because neither the dream nor the image, and I can't extract from it some further duty that involves social action, carrying out particular deeds for the collective, uh, um, as I started off with, protesting, uh, something which was suggested in the last lecture last night, uh, sending petitions or writing to people or trying to activate the government or setting up foundations as Nancy has done and trying to sort of uh, move the whole issue further. It doesn't say that. It doesn't compel us to do it. Your image only suggests that we need to relate to the collective because <clears throat> it's the milieu of individuation in our society. This is a commentator uh, wrote this, and I think it really sums up the implication is that it's only within the unity of the collective as a milieu in which perception and emotion can be unified that a subject can bring together these two sides of its psychic activity and to some degree coincide with itself. Yeah. This is a man called Coombs, who I disagree with and all other things, and I think that's why I, I couldn't get his name out or what he had to say. So what remains of the idea of collective individuation other than our awareness? Does it hint expressly or by implication? Can we get anything else out of it as to our duty? I think the mandala from what I propose does apply the approach that nothing active need be done in favor of 
the collective in terms of wider duties such as social action, because as people who seek to individu individuate, we're already offering deep relationships to individuals one by one in the collective by our deeds, however they are. But I think there's a bit more. My starting point for this difficult question is something Jung wrote in the Psychology of the Transference in 1946 that seems to imply there's something else that might be there. He's saying, we're not just working for the particular patient, you can read it, but um, working for our own soul. And at the end it says, the ultimate question of psychotherapy are not a private matter, they represent a supreme responsibility. We do this by little indivisible, small, infinitesimal grains, laying them down in the scales of humanity's soul. Laying the infinitesimal grain through symbolizing the self is our duty as we've canvassed, but because it's a supreme responsibility, does it need to go further and protect the collective to allow individuals to develop? Or does it only work grain by grain? Is it only your interactions with others, with friends and the community that actually is going to do it? We have to ask, is there another layer to this? Can we go a bit further than this? We have to, I think, first reframe the question. We have to say it acknowledges, we have to acknowledge that the individual, as Simondon calls it, exists in a quote, veritable theater of individuation. <clears throat> that there's a much larger process of individuation. He says, Simondon, that the collective unit provides the resolution of the individual problematic, which means the basis of the collective reality already forms a part of the individual. Individual, In other words, as he expresses it, we can't escape our collective role. We are part of the collective. And we have a responsibility that transcends our individual duty as intellectuals, psychotherapists. The question is then reframed. So if we're inexplicably bound to the collective, we're not just separate uh, going off as sudders into the distance. Um, what's our duty? Again, what's this question? How far do we have to go? I think the first thing is that one thing that Jung didn't particularly emphasize is the need to purify the ego, to relativize the ego. Um, and one of the ways in which this is done in other traditions, such as Hinduism, I'm thinking of uh, Sikhism, is the idea of service, the idea of service to the community. In fact, in Tibetan Buddhism, you, those of you who practice it or know about it would know that it's actually one of the four pillars of spiritual realization. You have to do various things, but you also have to serve the community. So this would apply to the self, as far as I'm concerned, in order to purify the ego, in order to get the ego out of the way, or what Esther Harding says, the main problem is egoism, the idea of everything abrogating to the ego and making it bigger and bigger. The only way we can do it is by service. We have to give service to the community. I think that applies to what the mandala is actually saying. The self re requires purification, it needs to reduce egoism to show uh, to allow greater realization of the self. The service that's needed in my view is towards communities in the collective, not for the collective as a whole. If you look at the, each of these is divided up by Jung into separate communities. The collective is always a series of communities. I also advance this proposition because it's an issue that has, um, in addition to my Jungian practice, been my life work. My involvement in urban planning is um, uh, spanning now 50 years is about how do you achieve opportunity to individuate in the collective by promoting well-being in separate communities. Uh, I've done so much of this in nine different countries in the UN to keep on making the case and pushing the case that areas have to be livable. 
in cities all across, I can name the ones in America, for instance, Portland, uh, uh, San Diego, and the homelessness that actually occurs. Um, the problem is that people aren't uh, working as communities. There's no social capital. And by social capital, I mean just this. I mean the, the possibility of actually creating interactions of neighbors, being able to create a sense of belonging, reduce alienation. Um, this seems to be implied in the mandala by the fact that you have these different communities all connected up. Individuals in this collective milieu where there is social capital become part of a protected connective framework. You know, one thing I always liked is in, uh, in Barcelona, a study was done about dating apps, and it said that the, the less use of dating apps in Barcelona because of the way that the public squares are all set up and people can come and meet each other and the ways that they can interact, uh, there's less alienation. Um, so creation of of environments that are more livable, as studies indicate, allow for individuation. However, these days I've got a slightly different approach uh, that made me ponder as I stared at the mandala, uh, whether the shine of the jewels can now be seen in a world where there's what I call urban trauma. I phrase it this way because in just a few years, 70% of the world will live in cities. And will have an urban collective of 6 billion people. And that's primarily where the problems are occurring. Where is the self in all that? How can it be displayed? How can we actually bring it to people other than those who can afford to come along to, to therapy? What concerns me is this new idea, which is gaining traction, which is the idea of this urban trauma, uh, which to use a quote says, occurs gradually and out of sight a violence of delayed destruction that is dispersed across time and space, a nutritional violence that's typically not viewed as violence at all. We can talk about it in terms of income inequality, uh, gender-based discrimination, domestic abuse, uh, loneliness, poor education, uh, slow displacement by gentrification and racism, um, not to mention other things of climate change, random violence, uh, um, housing unaffordability. So it's interesting that Jung's metaphor for his whole entire um, mandala is actually a city. Um, and a city at that time was much more benevolent. There's a history behind it of the cantons in Switzerland and the fact that they were independent and, um, without initially a central government. And his view of the city, he always said, was that city's a symbol of the self. I don't think the city is a symbol of the self anymore. I can only give you my view, my personal reaction to the, as I'm winding up, to the question of whether I have a duty for social action is that to the extent of my capabilities, I have this duty to manifest the self through my deeds to create a temenos for the collective. I, the best I can do is through working with governments, which is very frustrating because there are political interests and private interests involved, but nevertheless, just what I'm trying to do, <clears throat> in a sense, having spent years uh, manning the barricades, I realized, well, that's not particularly going anywhere as well. And in these times of climate change, um, there's so many personal interests and so much money involved in the whole thing that, the only way that I could act in that case is to try and create communities or work with people to try and create communities. That's my capabilities. And <clears throat> one would have to think, what are your capabilities? Because I am informed without doubt that without the self, without the realization of the power of the self, whatever you want to call it, that center in us, the numinous quality, the God within, without that, there's little hope. Uh, I know it sounds like a Jungian answer, but I, I want to really end, because I'm out of time, with <clears throat> uh, one statement that was made, which moved me incredibly. And I was um, I was invited to be the, which I did in 2016, the visiting scholar at the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia University, and uh, which all was about a year being spent at the conference to do with the problem of new problem of climate refugees. 
and people who can't live anymore in their homes because of the flooding. And a speaker from the Marshall Islands threatened with rapid destruction. In fact, from the time that I had that conference to now, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's getting extreme. He stood up and he said, we all must find God within us, in our hearts, to guide us rather than be thrown about by political and selfish forces. And then he sat down. He didn't give a whole talk with suffering in the Marshall Islands, etc. That's what he said. You have to find the self, the God within. We call it the image of God within, the center within. This was a repeated theme that I, I it is a repeated theme that I see with others. I, I heard it with all the speakers already. Um, I see it also in collapsing communities, that the way to deal with the threats to our existence is to recognize that we have this numinous power within us, that that has to come to the foreground and the problems have to go into the background. We have to get to Shiva. We have to get that blessing from the inner, the inner side of ourselves. So finally, I could say that, look, the self is amazing. I mean, the image that he did is extraordinary. Um, even as a painting, even as an image, it's so numinous. Um, it foresaw that any future must include psychological well-being in the context of the collective society. It doesn't appear to be any other image that strong, I feel, in having looked at him, of course, in the Red Book. And we look at it this way, Jung's mandala is actually saying to us, it's speaking to us, and it's saying, Look, I'm a mana personality. I'm the large personality. I realize the self. The possibility exists for you. You might not receive it in the same way. You might have an imperfect transformation, but that's your duty. It's there in religion. It's there in spirituality, in nature. The glowing center is what we have and carry our deeds. The image tells us we have no other option. Mm -hmm.